Okay. And time? Okay. Um, I want to welcome you to the um, Mayor's Commission for Citizens with Disabilities meeting. Um, I've just got, everybody was like trying to get my attention, like, please get started. Uh, so we shall. Um, we had a pre-meeting, discussed our uh, presentation next month, which will be uh, the Heartland Workforce um, Services. Uh, we've reached out to them previously, um, and we're hoping they will attend. Um, we did not reach a quorum, um, so uh, formal business of the commission will be uh, put off till the next time uh, we meet and do have a quorum. Um, we have, do have several folks on uh, who are virtually attending. I appreciate that. I appreciate also the members who were able to make it here in person, Megan and um, Nancy. Um, I'm sorry? Okay, it, but... So without further ado, I, I want to introduce Mr. Ian Freming. Uh, a little bit about Ian. Ian uh, just changed job. Uh, he worked at the Monroe Meyer Institute where we were acquainted. Um, uh, he, his work was around, um, and I'll let him get into the details on this, but work was around employment and finding employment for uh, individuals with disabilities. Um, in his new job, he's working uh, at the Madonna School Program uh, that is focused on uh, transition and employment uh, under the auspices of that, that, um, that institution. Um, and what we've asked Ian to, to come speak to us about was kind of the status of uh, disability employment in the Omaha area uh, with COVID-19. Um, and other issues that, it, you know, we're seeing a lot of unemployment. Um, in past uh, discussions with, you know, folks who identify as having a disability, um, that was identified as the top priority was, you know, we would like jobs. And so um, folks like Ian and others are um, stepping up to, to, to make that a reality. So without further ado, um, I'll introduce Mr. Ian Freming. Awesome. You're up, Ian. Thanks, Mark. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Do you guys have the capability of popping it in there? Maybe if I can get into my PowerPoint. There we go. Nicely done. Yeah, thank you. Sometimes I'm good with technology. there's a host, I can give you the... I'm the host, but it's not going to show for me because <laughs> I'm not sure why. Um, would you try sharing? 
Yep, it says the host is has not enabled uh, screen sharing. There we go. Oh, you got it. Okay. That's a, a professional operation if I've ever seen it. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Hopefully everybody can see that um, PowerPoint. But again, my name is Ian Fremming. Um, I work for the Madonna School currently, and um, I've worked with the USED in the past as their employment services liaison. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, as Mark said, I'm currently the director of navigation services for Madonna School. My primary focus for them is to help parents and guardians and individuals navigate the complex Medicaid and funding systems that are available to them and make sure that they can um, get the assistance that they need to to live the most full and complete life possible. So prior to that, I worked with Mark at the USED at the Monroe Meyer Institute. Um, I've been working with individuals for with disabilities for the last 10 years, and I've had an emphasis on employment for those individuals for about the last five years. Um, I'm a certified so, um, employment support professional through the National APSI Association. So that means I'm certified in job development, job coaching, career planning, um, and benefits planning as well. Um, just recently, I acquired my Community Partner Work Incentive Coordinator Certification through Virginia Commonwealth University and the Social Security Administration. So that allows me to have access um, to individual cases um, for their Social Security, um, Social Security Disability, all their different benefits do math, plug in a bunch of numbers to a bunch of different formulas and tell you how much you can work and keep your benefits. So um, first, I kind of want to talk about employment first and the philosophy behind employment first. So um, if you'll notice in the bottom left hand corner of the slide, we've got the Nebraska APSI logo and it says employment first, employment for all. A lot of people get confused when they hear employment first. Um, they think that it's, we're going to force you to work. We're going to take you out of a situation that you're comfortable in and put you in a situation that we feel like is best suited for you. And that's not true at all. All the employment first philosophy is saying is that when you transition out of school-based services, your first option for acquiring services should be helping you get to work. Okay, right now, um, as of today in the United States, 42 states have either employment first legislation, directives, or an executive order. Out of the eight remaining states, Nebraska is the only one without activity. Um, activity means that there are bills, legislation, executive orders, or directives in the works. They just haven't been voted on or ratified yet. So when we're talking about employment for people with disabilities, there's a lot of terms that, that come up. Competitive employment is, is the biggest and most glaring most of the time. And competitive employment um, is defined as work on a full or part-time basis um, where individuals are compensated on their work and it's within an integrated setting. So it would be a job that's available to the general public it is paid a competitive wage, so above minimum wage, and it's in an integrated setting. So you're working with individuals with disabilities as well as individuals who don't identify as having a disability. The other form of employment for people with disabilities is sheltered workshop. And this refers to an organization or environment that employs people solely with disabilities to work separate from others, and they are paid based on their amount of work that they can complete. So they can be paid a subminimum wage um, wage to complete the work. So for example, if 
you were working on an assembly line, instead of getting paid nine bucks an hour, which is minimum wage in Nebraska, you would get paid by the amount of pieces that you were able to put together on that assembly line. The problem that comes along with sheltered workshops is individuals will then get a check for two weeks worth of work that's $8.50. So is that really worth it to the individual? The business then looks like they're taking advantage of the individual. And it's not always the best setting for individuals with disabilities. Now, I'm not saying that shelter workshops should completely go away. I'm not one of those people. Um, I believe they have their place in this world, but we need to make sure that that place stays in that place and doesn't grow to other areas where exploitation can happen. Yeah, if, if I might, Ian, at, at one point, um, I think sheltered workshops was kind of the state of the art, uh, but this we're going back decades now. And what we found over time is that um, people just kind of got stuck there. Yeah. And it really didn't turn into, uh, um, there, there was a, just a lack of meaningful progress and uh, lack of the probably, for lack of a better word, the, the healthiest or the, the most encouraging environment. So yeah, uh, there's been a lot more discussion about, and, and again, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, when we talk to folks with disabilities, they that's what they say they want to do is is go out and, and, and work and earn if they can. Right. And I, I don't believe that if an individual has been in a sheltered workshop environment for a long period of time and they're comfortable and they're happy and that's what they want to continue doing, that they should be pulled out of that environment. I'm, I'm one of the kind of few proponents of within APSI of you should have your choice. If you want to go into a sheltered workshop, that's what you should do. If you want to gain competitive employment, then that's what you should do. And I just want to make sure that each individual has the supports to pursue whatever pathway they feel like is best for them. As, as well as to try work to be able to make an informed choice. Yeah, yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> There should never be an end-all, be-all in this business. Mm -hmm. That's the, <laughs> those are scary, scary conversations. So right now, um, what assistance is there available to individuals seeking competitive employment in Douglas County and further across the state? Um, the largest proponent of funding for um, individuals seeking employment is Vocational Rehabilitation of Nebraska. So they provide funding for employment agencies to provide the initial job coaching supports needed to acquire and maintain employment. They also provide a variety of different work experiences and training programs to adults as well as transition-aged youth. Um, about five years ago, to, under WIOA, VR had to really, really expand the amount of individuals that they were taking into their programs. Um, they previously only worked with adults, um, mostly on employment, but now they're starting as early as 14 and in, or 16 and in some cases 14 um, within the school districts to give individuals opportunities to experience a variety of different work experiences. They also manage our Ticket to Work program in Nebraska. This program is focused on helping an individual gain and maintain full-time employment um, while slower, slowly lowering their level of government assistance. So um, this program works really, really well for some people and does not work well for others. Um, the idea of Ticket to Work is that you would no longer be a beneficiary of Medicaid after you have completed the program. You want to get off that um, federal assistance and state assistance as much as possible and put the onus on the employer to make sure that they take care of your health care um, insurance needs. And then they are also the manager of Project Search in Nebraska. Um, Project Search is a nationwide program that is centered around <clears throat> immersing individuals within a business to give them an opportunity to try out three to four different jobs within the business. 
Um, Nebraska right now is number four in the country as far as number of sites per state. We are currently running at 14 sites um, across Nebraska. We also have one of four um, integrated sites in the country which are service adults as well as um, transition age youth. So the program at UNMC in Monroe Meyer not only helps individuals transition out of school-based services and into competitive employment, it also, helps them, it also helps adults transition out of either a day service setting or a sheltered workshop setting into competitive employment. The Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services and specifically their Developmental Disabilities Division, um, they provide funding through HCBS waivers to provide supported employment after the VR, VR milestones have been exhausted. H so, HCBS. Uh, home and Community Based Services. Thank you. <laughs> Um, sorry, I live in a world of acronyms, so you guys got to stop me if... if as, as do we all. Yeah. Um, so I'll get in a little bit more to that later, but just know that the initial part of getting a job, acquiring um, competitive employment, going through the interview process, and the initial start to the job is covered by VR, and then you transition over to funding through um, the Department of Health and Human Services. We also have Easter Seals of Nebraska. So Easter Seals is the WIPA services contract holder for the state of Nebraska. WIPA is the Workforce Innovations and Planning Act that was, um, or sorry, Planning and Assistance Act that was um, passed under Obama. And that, the whole idea of that program is to make sure that people can work and not lose their benefits. So they do things like benefits planning services, career planning, um, a lot of what my job is as a um, CIPWIC, CPWIC through Social Security. Um, they do the same thing through Easter Seals. And then you have the various employment agencies across the state. Um, these can be specifically employment agencies. They can be um, day programs. They can sometimes be based out of school districts, depending on the size of the um, community that they're serving. Um, and they are funded through the things like VR, Ticket to Work, Home and Community Based Waiver Services, and they're the boots on the ground. They uh, provide the direct job development and job coaching services to individuals. So the big question is, is how does Nebraska stack up to the other states across the nation? So this is, these are a couple graphs and numbers from our National Core Indicator Survey um, that was done through the Monroe Meyer Institute in collaboration with DHHS. Um, and it kind of paints a picture of what's happening in Nebraska as far as employment goes. Um, so this first graph here on the left, you'll see has a paid job in the community and an individual um, group or business that primarily hires people with disabilities. So these would most likely be your sheltered workshop individuals. And right now we're seeing about 40% of individuals that we surveyed um, are in that setting, whereas the national average is about 20%. So you're seeing a much higher rate of sheltered workshop in Nebraska than in other states. Um, the next graph is does not have a paid job and would like to or like a job in the community, and that's 40%. That's about where the national average is. Um, most individuals want to work, want to do something, um, so those numbers match up. Um, the next one is attends a day program or a workshop. Here again, we're kind of highlighting the fact that a lot of individuals across the state utilize a sheltered workshop environment, which is what we're trying to move a bit away from. I would personally like to see this 80% number be down closer to 40%, because I believe that that's probably about where um, the individuals should be. There's gonna be about half of the individuals who are going to want to work in a sheltered workshop environment, and there's going to be half that don't. Um, so I'd really like to see this number go down. 
And then what are we doing to kind of get individuals out of these sheltered workshop environments and gain more work skills? This one is the biggest graph in my opinion. Takes classes or train, takes classes, training, or does something to get a job or do better at the current job. We're looking at about 12%. That's a rough number. That means that individuals are either not moving forward they're not learning about different experiences that they could have. And in some of the communities, that, that training's just not available. Um, you mentioned you're gonna have Heartland Workforce Solutions next week, and they are doing a really, really good job trying to tackle disabilities. Um, sometimes I think like they feel they're, like they're closing their eyes and throwing a dart and hoping they hit something. Um, but they have a strong emphasis on figuring out how to help the disability community. They just kind of need the tools um, to get in there and help. And a lot of that has to do with education. Absolutely. You know, you know educating um, the businesses about here's a whole population that they haven't considered, you know, and also it's that education for parents and guardians because sometimes they, that can become a barrier, you know, because that sheltered employment's comfortable, it's yep. safe. So it's, you know, there's a lot of work that all of us can do to help with that. Absolutely. So what are some of the steps Nebraska is doing to improve employment numbers with people with disabilities? Um, over the last six months, there's been I know we've had COVID and we've had the virus and it's, it's, it's been kind of a shakeup for everything. But prior to that, we were getting a lot of strong push to improve the funding for um, programs across the state that help individuals acquire and maintain competitive employment. So a big thing that happened about three and a half, four years ago was the coordination of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and Vocational Rehabilitation and how they can work together to make sure that we have good employment outcomes for people with disabilities across the state. Um, so a few things that they did were the, um, vocational rehabilitation has a very large wait list right now for their services and um, through the Center of Medicaid Services our outgoing director of Medicaid, Courtney Miller, was able to um, institute an interpretation of the rulings for CMS in the duplicating and supplanting services um, realm to say that if an individual was on the wait list for VR services, that those services were deemed not available to that individual. Therefore, they could utilize home and community-based services waiver funding to support that individual in going through different employment programs. So prior to that ruling, we had a lot of individuals just sitting around waiting for that funding to come through so that they could be served. Um, and that was a really, really rough six months for Nebraska and employment for people with disabilities in Nebraska. Um, and luckily we got over that hurdle and we're beyond that now. So we're moving past that. Um, the other big change was another interpretation change by um, Department of Health and Human Services on pre-vocational funding. Pre-vocational funding was originally utilized to help individuals become successful within the sheltered workshop environment. So it was not utilized to help an individual who is a bagger at high V become a cashier. That would not have qualified as a pre-vocational program. Um, it was meant for individuals who had a tough time making it through the day in the workshop to be able to make it through the day in the workshop. Um, we hit a lot of roadblocks and there was a lot of advocacy done by um, the Nebraska APSI chapter and the Nebraska Association of um, Service Providers or NASP um, to overrule that interpretation and, and change that idea of pre-vocational funding in Nebraska to 
we just we want to improve an individual's employment even though they have employment so luckily again we've kind of overcome that hurdle and like I said there's advocacy efforts going on across the state Nebraska APSI, the ARC of Nebraska, NASP, um, the Parent Training Institute has a fantastic partnership with Easter Seals to do um, the Family Employment Awareness Training or FEET training. Um, they do it, I think, three or four times a year. And um, that's a really, really great two-day course that parents, guardians, individuals, anybody can go through to kind of dispel some of the myths that come along with um, employing people with disabilities and some of the risks that come along with it. Um, and that's, that's gonna go ahead and end my presentation. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, I know Mark, you said that um, you wanted to talk a little bit about COVID and the impact on people with disabilities with COVID. Um, and I think unfortunately right now that's a little bit too new to have any good solid data on, but um, I can see it from my perspective working in a service provider agency that there are a lot of individuals who um, had employment are now losing employment or being furloughed um, because of COVID. You know, it, the stimulus checks, it wasn't really well communicated through Social Security whether you would be eligible or not for a stimulus check. Um, and I think there were a lot of people that, that didn't think they were going to get a stimulus check but ended up getting a stimulus check. And so that created, you know, a lot of fear of am I going to lose my benefits? I don't want this money. It's going to put me over the Medicaid threshold. Um, so luckily, you know, Easter Seals, community partner work incentive coordinators were hopefully able to get out and um, kind of hit the ground and talk to individuals and make sure that they're doing what they need to to maintain their benefits and that reassure them that this wouldn't be affecting their benefits. So yeah, one of the things that came to mind when we were first talking in was uh, you mentioned, for example, that that Nebraska is a locus for Project Search Program. Uh, and yet it would seem that Project Search being, you know, uh, uh, a program that inserts people into businesses, and a lot of businesses are either closed or are only working at partial capacity, whether a, an example like, a positive example like Project Search has really been muted as a you know a opportunity for folks to get work um, so on the project search front the the most common thing that happens throughout the process of starting a um, project search site is the employers are thrilled and proud to be a supporter of project search they want the individuals on campus they want to be a part of this program their friends hear about it and then they want to be a part of this program that's why it's been so successful in or in nebraska and we kind of saw that with the covid crisis the employers didn't come from a we don't want to be a part of it it's too big of a risk standpoint it was almost across the board we want this to happen. What do we need to do to make it happen? So um, I know I've spoken with uh, Bridget Griffin, who is the state coordinator for um, Project Search mm -hmm. through Nebraska VR. Um, she set up monthly meetings with um, kind of all the Project Search teams to talk it out. They've been collaborating on different virtual ideas so that they can, you know, split the time on camp or on campus make sure they don't have more than 10 people in a, in a classroom at the same time, and still make it comfortable for the employers. I have not seen a lot of pushback from employers on having individuals with disabilities on their campus um, and on their business sites. 
Um, but there is still, the, the concern that I've seen more is from parents. Mm -hmm. And is it safe for me to send my kid to, you know, a hotel and have them work? So I think right now, the the hesitancy is more on the individuals and the parents than it is necessarily on the business which is a hundred percent understandable i'm not saying that that's wrong by any means it's just kind of that is what it is and and i i think i was just going to say i'm we didn't have a chance to introduce ourselves i got to thinking yeah, about if, that if you would when yeah. when if you have a question for ian please and go okay. ahead and introduce okay. yourself I'm, I'm Nancy Floral, and I'm with the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So we're the voc rehab that provides um, services to visually impaired, blind, and deafblind. And I was going to say, I, I think that that's true. It's oftentimes um, the parent or a family member. And, you know, so often sometimes individuals with disability might have a secondary health concern, you know, as a part of that. But I also think that one thing that's really nice about Project Search is the Business Advisory Committee because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the businesses that have a commitment to the program obviously can't assure that they're going to actually hire every one of those, those students that um, are a part of that year's rotation or class, but that um, collectively the Advisory Council and committees working together, these skills will transfer to positions in the community. And so working strongly to help um, individuals get placed, and that's where that success rate has come from, is that most of the students that complete a program are, they have like 90, 89 or 90% success yeah. rate with their placement. Yep, when I was at um, UNMC, when I uh, managed the contracts for Project Search and mm -hmm. was the business liaison for, um, the project search site at UNMC, and we were running at about a 92% um, successful placement rate, mm -hmm. and we were only hiring about 18% on campus. Right. So mm -hmm. the majority of our uh, graduates were employed in businesses um, throughout the Omaha community. The other thing that we, we took um, kind of a big emphasis on was we were getting individuals from all over the city mm -hmm into our program because we accepted adults and because we accepted um, Madonna accepts rural school contracts. So there were places like Bennington and um, UTAN and those surrounding communities that would send their um, individuals to Madonna and then they would go through Project Search. And a big emphasis we had was we're not doing you any good if you live in Bennington and we get you a job at the Med Center and then you can't get there or you're paying an Uber $80 a day to go make $40 a day. That doesn't make sense. So we wanted you to be employed within your community and where you lived. And um, Project Search really, really does a good job nationally of emphasizing how important it is to integrate yourself within your community, mm -hmm. not the community that we choose for you. So. Okay, I have, a, I have a few questions. Um, yeah. Megan Walls with the Histology. Um, so kind of backing up to some of your earlier stuff when you were talking about some of the legislation and Nebraska being a state that doesn't have a lot of action on their legislation. Mm -hmm. How can we on the commission or individuals in the community help create some of that action and that employment first initiatives that are just sitting there? I think the... The tough part about Nebraska is if you ask Nebraskans to do the right thing, they'll do the right thing, and you don't necessarily need to make a law to get them to do the right thing. And so I think that's why um, historically we have not pushed for legislation um, to, to govern whether or not an individual is going to be seeking employment or not. Um, so that that to me would be the biggest philosophical barrier is why do we need it? Um, we've always, you know, we've had really good employment numbers, you know, going back to the seventies, we were on the forefront of employing people with disabilities. Um, and then we kind of laxed on it in, you know, the early two thousands, it started to go down and now we're, we're looking at an upward trend again. So, um, what I would say to those proponents is 
we're not talking about individuals who are 25 and up. They don't need the employment first legislation. What we're talking about is the parents of that five-year-old kid who you know has Down syndrome that a doctor somewhere has told them that they're you know they're not going to live a fulfilled life and they're always going to have to have this and they're always going to have to have that we want to get those parents and say no we're not putting limitations on your child we're not going to you know stop them from living a fulfilled life and gaining competitive employment they might be appropriate for competitive employment. They might be not. You know, they, they could be want to go work in a sheltered workshop, and that's their choice, but we're not going to put that limit on them. So if you get that pushback when bringing it up with senators of, you know, why do we need this legislation? Why do we need this to happen? It's, it's because we need to reach those younger families and start that process at a young age when, when limitations haven't been put on them yet. Great. And then there was mention throughout your, your presentation about that pre-vocational side of things. Mm -hmm. Just for the audience, can you give some examples of what falls under those pre-vocational activities or services? Yeah, so um, in the home and community-based waiver services, there's a pre-vocational definition. And, um, this isn't the exact terminology, but it's, it's any program meant to help an individual either gain, maintain, or progress through employment. So when I look at that, I see a situation like a project search. Why is that not a pre-vocational program? You are taking an individual, you're giving them different experiences to try and figure out what they like, once they figure out what they like, you're able to hone those skills um, and really get them to where they want to be in their employment. That traditionally wasn't how it was looked at. Um, and it was merely an interpretation of what the service definition is. So we just had new service definitions come in. Um, I think it was November of last year, October, November of last year. And the pre-vocational funding definition didn't change at all. Um, it was simply an interpretation by DHHS of how do we want to fund programs. Um, so now they are much more open to the idea of training programs such as like Project Search being funded through um, home and community-based waiver services. So what I would like to see in the future is a like a Metro Community College partner with an adult service agency to, you know, get pipelines towards the different trades, um, have a UNO partner with a day service program to have a pathway to careers in administration or, you know, office work, things like that, school-based services. So um, I really think Nebraska is going in the right direction um, and is a much more open to the different possibilities that can come with pre-vocational training programs. Uh, just wanted to comment quickly. Uh, I, I like the fact you brought up higher education opportunities, Ian, because I think that kind of gets past us sometime when we sometimes when we think about um, the experience of transitioning youth who are entering adulthood. Um, most, many of us go to college in order to learn how to do the, the work that we're, we're pursuing and yet we don't really think of that, yet there are programs in the, that are emerging within the state um, and within the city uh, that uh, will allow for folks that were not typically seen as somebody who would be eligible for higher education uh, training to get that training with the idea that it would lead to them being able to do the kind of work that they wanted to do, whatever that might be. Definitely. Sorry, I think I might have interrupted. Them. <laughs> You're okay. Um, and this might be this might be an unfair question in the sense that there's not one straight or direct answer. So maybe it's a multi-tiered. But I like those questions. <laughs> so, what would you recommend for for families that are listening and say have those early teenage children or children going through that transition age? So, kind of that 
maybe up to you know 25 26 in that kind of range like if they want more information or they need to know what their their child qualifies for or an individual themselves wants to find out what's what do you recommend is like their first or or their top three places to call and connect and get that information um the first thing that i would do is suggest that they talk to their school district their school district is going to be um the school districts in nebraska are pretty well connected with um, the different state agencies um, the second place I would direct them to is other parents of individuals with disabilities. Um, I am not a parent unless you count my English Springer Spaniel, which I do for most, most of the time, but not on my taxes. So um, they, it, parents have the best real life experience and they know they know best. I mean, they, they know the bad stuff, they know the good stuff, they know the right people to contact, and they, they have the community. So I would definitely recommend um, parents second. And then third, just, kind of just Googling stuff. You know, if, I know that's like such a millennial thing to say, and it's, it sounds ridiculous, but um, that's how I found the Nebraska APSI chapter. You know, I didn't know about it before I started diving into what employment things are happening in Nebraska. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of boards that um, parents can become a part of. I don't think there's a single board in, in Nebraska that works with people with disabilities that would turn a parent away, um, you know, to do some work on their boards. Just, just communicate with, with your community. And, and figure out what's out there. So I know that that's, there's not like a one-stop shop for it. Um, you know, Heartland Workforce would say, send you to the one-stop operator in the American Job Center and work through that way on employment. But there again, that might not be, that's, a, that's painting a broad brush. And we work so much in the business of individuals that what works for all might not work for your individual. So you, you have to get out, you have to try stuff, you have to connect with people, you have to be open to those conversations. Um, but yeah, schools first, parents, and then advocacy boards are all, all great places to start. Ian, do you mind if I'm, I'm on Zoom, so it's nice to meet you. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. I'm Lisa Sherman. I'm a pastor here in Omaha, and I also serve on the State Emergency Management Advisory Council as a, a family advocate and disability advocate. My husband and I have adopted five special needs children. And one thing that, and, and I so appreciate the, the number you just, the, the checklist you just gave, but for parents to be number two, on getting information and giving it to each other, we have to know who each other are. And when your children go through in the primary system right now is the public school system for 18 years, or at least to age 21, due to confidentiality, um, my child that has no special needs, I know who all of his classmates are and their parents are and how to contact them. But my children with special needs, I don't know who the other students are, who the parents are, to even go to them to be able to ask them, who do you recommend as a doctor? Who do you recommend in this area? Who, who, who do you trust? And so there is a gap there for parents that if you're not a parent, you don't realize how monumental that gap is. Yeah, definitely. And there again, if, you're, if your individual is in school-based services, I, I would point that spear at the school district and I would say, hey, look, we need a group to connect. Can we start a you know, parent advocacy group within our school that talks about just individuals with disabilities and special education? Um, and I know that there's no there's no hotline to call. Unfortunately, there's there's not um, a connect. But I've seen some of the biggest connections that I've seen over the last 
two to three years have been on Facebook groups. You know, um, Down Syndrome Alliance has a fantastic social media footprint. Um, the Nebraska A&D Waivers family has grown immensely over the last um, kind of year and a half and developed that community. So I know it's, it's not the answer you want to hear and it's not, there's nothing easy out there, but if you see that gap, reach out to someone who can try and fill that gap. I guarantee you there's a teacher within that school district that has, um, has history or wants to help you with your situation and maybe they can start something and push something through to their principal or their administrator or again it's it's hard to paint a broad brush in an individual um you know individual emphasized realm well and it's probably probably worth mentioning that um there you you had mentioned like the parent training and information center mm -hmm. um is a good place to go to get started in terms of getting in touch with folks that can point you, whether it's another parent or an organization. Um, you know, there's uh, the, the different federal partners. There's there's a lot out there. VR, you had mentioned. I mean, yep. those are, and the goal I know in the state, at least in terms of the goal, is that, um, we'd be better connected through our aging and disability resource center work. Um, it's not there yet, but the idea is that whatever door you enter gets you to the person, place, or thing that you need to get to in terms of what, you know, what kind of services your child or you need. So um, there's efforts going on. We're, we're just not quite there yet. And also, if any of you guys, my information is right there on the screen. So if any of you guys run into parents or um, if you're a parent or you have a question or something doesn't seem right or you need to get connected, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. That is my job within Madonna School and Madonna would have no problem with me helping out someone who doesn't go to Madonna. That's not their philosophy there and we're not going to shut the door in your face I'll, I'll figure something out at least to try and help you connect and maybe start there so um was it lisa that that's who was talking right um yes lisa, thank Le you thank you very much yeah if you want to reach out to me just shoot me an email call my office um if it's eight to four that's my office number if it's after outside those hours give me a call on my cell. I usually pick up unless I'm on the golf course or the boat. So, um, and I'll try and get get back to you as soon as I can. Or, or chasing your child. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, any other questions for Ian? I was just gonna say, I know that they're talking about a possible second round of stimulus checks and that, so I would just also, you know, I know that that first round we helped um, the whole blind and visually impaired community reached out um, to really talk to people about if you're on SSI or SSDI, you're going to get this. And we also discussed um, the benefits of making sure that you have an Enable Savings account yes. to be able to put that in that money in that savings account so that it's not going to impact you know any your Medicaid or um, your Social Security benefits. So, yeah, and and on that benefits point that is the one time in this world that I will not tell you to turn to parents for the information mm -hmm. that that is such an individualized thing there can be so many different factors that go into decisions that Social Security makes so please if you have those questions on benefits Social Security Medicaid Medicare anything like that contact easter seals contact the WIPA agency contact a vr coordinator um, just make an initial call on those you, you will get directed to the right person if you call one of the different entities but please don't try and do that yourself that's that's a massive undertaking and there's so many intricacies to those services that um, 
And some big implications. And huge implications, definitely. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you really so much. This. Um, since I, since we're a little bit out of order or out of our usual order here, um, what I'd like to do is have everybody go around and, and again introduce yourself one more time if you haven't already, and then if you have any announcements, and that includes all of you on uh, Zoom. Um, so I'll start. I'm Mark Smith. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center's Monroe Meyer Institute, as, as Ian uh, shared. Um, and I am here representing uh, individuals with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'm also a parent and a sibling. And my announcement would be um, the, uh, we had a great 30th anniversary of the ADA celebration activities last week, uh, five different presentations. Um, and the good news is, is if you didn't attend any of those presentations, yeah. they're being recorded and I will have information in the future um, about how you can access those because we had some terrific speakers and it was just a, a, a great experience. So. Um, I'm Megan Walls. I am sit on the vice chair for the commission board and my company is a systology. We offer consulting and training to help increase accessibility of activities and environments in our community. Um, and I am here representing the greater, the interest of the greater disability community. And again, I am Nancy Floro. I'm with the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and we serve individuals that are visually impaired, blind, and deaf blind. And I would say um, for our announcement, this coming Friday, we're celebrating our 20th year as an independent commission. Um, and um, our agency, in some form, it started out under like Department of Public Institutions a long time ago in like 1917, um, and, um, but as an independent commission, 20 years. Um, but also it is, um, Mark was just saying, the 30th anniversary of ADA that we're celebrating, and it's also the 100th year anniversary of vocational rehabilitation. So if anyone would like to be invited I, to our virtual event, I'd be glad to send out a link. Thank you. How about the folks that are on the phone? or on the, on the Zoom, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Jen Pollock. I um, work for Miller Public Schools. I am a special education program facilitator and I represent Miller Public Schools on this mission. Um, my announcements is we are working tire tirelessly to figure out how to provide students with their free and appropriate public education this fall. So we keep uh, monitor monitoring and adjusting and we're quite nimble right now, but I'm confident that we'll come up with something that's gonna work for all. Hang in there on that, Jen. Absolutely. I'm Laura Young with the League of Human Dignity. Um, we support people independent living wise under the sales side. And we also have the Medicaid waiver contract. So we also do that as well for people that need Medicaid waiver. Our announcement again, if you qualify for our services in any way, shape or form, we do have PPE stuff that we are are distributing hand soap, sanitizer, a great cleaner disinfectant, um, gloves and masks. Okay, thanks Laura. Okay, I'm Rachel. Um, I work with QLI with individuals with brain, recent brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. And I also live with a spinal cord injury and like to represent that population. Um, I don't really have any announcements other than I really, really appreciated Ian's presentation. And I'm actually going to be doing my uh, master's social work final internship at Burke High School um, starting in August. So I'll be keeping in mind a lot of things that were discussed today and see um, you know, if I can't apply those to, to helping out the students in that setting, especially because it's all new dealing with um, going back to school during COVID times. So and thanks guys. Thanks Rachel. If you, if you lose Ian's contact information, I know how to find him. Not okay, problem. great. Cause yeah, we might be back in touch depending on what comes up. You bet. You bet. Thank you. 
Again, I'm Lisa Sherman. I'm the pastor at Faith Christian Church. I also serve on the State of Nebraska Emergency Management Advisory Council as Disability and Family um, Advisor. I also serve on the State of Nebraska CISM Critical Incident Rapid Response um, Stress Management Team uh, in the area of uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and, uh, and other disabilities as well as having five children with special needs. So I represent a, a wide variety. My announcement is I know our lives have turned upside down because of COVID. It's changed how we've done everything. And one of the places that's greatly affected us is in our spiritual life or in our church setting. If you are a member of a church and you are not able to attend because of COVID, but you have, um, and they do not have online um, knowledge or, or anything, reach out to our church. We'll help your church um, establish that and and kind of get up on its feet um, so that um, they can uh, help administer to their congregation. Um, so we will share whatever knowledge that we have and kind of mentor them um, as, as we're moving into this new era of, of how to do church and, and spiritual leadership during this time. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and my name is Emily Costello. I'm a used trainee under Mark, who kind of invited me to this event today. Um, and I'm also a sibling of someone with a disability. So I don't have any announcements. Thanks, Em. I, th I think we've covered everybody. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, if you're if you're watching this, uh, I hope there was some really good information. Well, there will be some. I think additionally, very good information around employment, um, uh, not next week, but next month. Um, Ian talked about in your meeting next week. It's like, oh, no, I don't think we're meeting next week. Um, again, we meet uh, the third Monday, no, the fourth Monday, of um, at 3.30. Um, uh, these uh, broadcasts are available on YouTube on the mayor's uh, site under commissions. Um, we're still working on seeing if we can get these uh, broadcasted over public access, but I, we'll, we'll see how that one goes. That's been a long, a long battle. So I want to thank uh, the audience, thank our presenter, Ian, who had to run, and thank the commission members uh, for our discussion today. Thanks very much. See you next month.